Alrighty, so we're going to take a look at the section B of the A-Level Physics Paper 1 in, from 2017. Uh, so starting off with calculating specific charge. Specific means per unit mass, so we're essentially working out the charge per unit mass. So it's gained three electrons, so it's going to have a charge of minus three times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. And its total mass is going to be the 16 nucleons. Divide those together and we get a specific charge of minus 1.8 times 10 to the 7, which is B. Uh, we want the diagram representing beta plus decay. So in beta plus decay, a proton turns into a neutron. So we want an up quark going into a down quark. So we want either A or B. And we also want a electron neutrino being produced to balance out the antiparticle positron. So a beam of light of wavelength, lambda, is instant on a clean metal surface and photoelectrons are emitted. The wavelength of light is halved, but the energy incident per second is kept the same, which table is correct. So if you halve the wavelength, you double the frequency, which means you double the photon energy, which means you're going to increase the maximum kinetic energy. So it's got to be A or C. But if the total energy per second is kept the same and each photon has double the energy, that means half the number of photons are arriving, which means the number of photoelectrons emitted is going to decrease. OK. So electrons moving in a beam have the same de Broglie wavelength as protons in a separate beam moving at a speed of 2.8 times 10 to the 4. What is the speed of the electrons? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make their two wavelengths equal to each other. And we can cancel out the Planck's constant, rearrange to make the velocity of electrons a subject, plug the numbers in, and that gives us an answer of D. So the diagram shows an energy level diagram of a hydrogen atom. Electrons with energy of 13 electron volts collide with atoms of hydrogen in their ground state. What is the number of different wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation that could be emitted when the atoms de-excite? So the first thing is to work out which energy level it would get excited up to and we can see the highest it could get is minus 0.6 electron volts so it's going to go up to level three so from level three it could come straight down to ground state it could go to level one and then down to ground state it could go to level two and then it could go to level one or it could go straight down to ground state and you can see there are six unique photon energies that could be produced by that process and even if it gets excited, say, to level two or level one by the electron, we still have the same number of photons being produced. So the graph shows how the vertical height of traveling wave varies with distance along the path. The speed is 20 centimeters per second. What is the time period? Well, from the graph, we can measure that the wavelength is four centimeters. And since both the speed and the wavelength are in centimeters, we can just straight away divide those and get a frequency of 5 hertz, which means the time period is 0.2 seconds. Which statement is not correct for ultrasound and x-rays? So ultrasound is a longitudinal wave, x-rays are an electromagnetic transverse wave, and that's why both of them cannot be polarized, because ultrasound is longitudinal, it cannot be polarized, but all the other processes can happen to both. A station wave is set up on a stretched string of length L and diameter D. Another station wave is also set up on a second string made from the same material and the same tension as the first. What length and diameter are required for the second string so that the strings both have the same first harmonic frequency? So first thing, I'm going to get an expression for mu in terms of the density and the diameter of the string. So they're the same material, so the density is going to be the same, but they've got different diameters. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to equate the two equations for their fundamental frequency together with L1 and mu1, L2 and mu2, but the tension is the same, so it cancels out. Then I'm going to rearrange to get the expression we have at the end. So if they're going to be equal to each other, whatever we do to L1, we need to do the opposite to D1. So um, the only column that meets that is the C. So we've halved the length, so we need to double the diameter. Um, so that's the one we're going to need. OK, so when monochromatic light source is inserted on two slits of the same width, an interference pattern is produced. 
One slit is then covered with opaque black paper. What is the effect of covering one slit on the resulting interference pattern? So the answer is C. We're going to see fewer maxima. And the way I thought about this is um, we, when you have a single slit, you get a double width central fringe. As we get a much wider central fringe, and what we are also going to have, therefore, is the the fringes are going to be spread out much further apart. And that's my logic for thinking, well, if we're spreading further apart, if you have the same screen, we're not going to see as many maxima um, being produced. And given the maximum angle we can see them is at 90 degrees, again, we're going to have fewer maxima in that space if we have a much wider central maximum. Okay, so when light of order wavelength 5 times 10 to minus 7 is instant normally on a diffraction grating, the fourth order maximum is observed at an angle of 30 degrees. What is the number of lines per millimeter on the diffraction grating? So I started with the standard diffraction grating equation and then substituted it in d equals 1 over n, where n is the number of lines per meter. Solved what n was by plugging in the numbers to get lines per meter divided by a thousand to get lines per millimeter, which is clearly option A. A light uniform rigid bar is pivoted at its center, force stacked on the bar at its end and the center. Which diagram shows a bar in equilibrium? So the first two that you can eliminate are these ones, because in these diagrams, the resultant force is not equal to zero. There is a resultant force upward in B, and there's a resultant force downward in D. So they're clearly not in equilibrium, but the other A and C both fit, have a resultant force of zero. So now we need to look for the one where the moments are balanced, and the only one where the moments are balanced is A, because the two Newton forces form a couple, um, which has the same moment as that four Newton force the opposite direction, so that would be in equilibrium. Which row gives two features of graphs that provide the same information? So the gradient of a displacement time graph is velocity. The, great, the area under a velocity time graph is displacement. So it's not that one. Gradient of displacement time graph, velocity. Area under an acceleration time graph is the change in velocity of the object. Not strictly the same, but I think that's the one they're going for. Gradient velocity time is acceleration. Area under a displacement time has a special name, but we don't need to worry about it. Uh, gradient velocity time graph acceleration. Area under acceleration time graph change in velocity. So it's going to be B. That's the closest to being correct. Um, a rocket of mass uh, 12 tons accelerates vertically upwards from the surface of the Earth at 1.4 meters per second squared. What is the thrust of the rocket? So I'm going to use Newton's second law, assuming the mass of the rocket stays the same. And the thrust is going to be the resultant force plus the weight force. Plug the numbers in and we end up with option C. So figure 12 shows the path of projectile launched from the ground level with a speed of 25 meters per second at an angle of 42 degrees horizontal. What is the horizontal distance from the starting point of the projectile when it hits the ground? So the starting point I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out how long it's in the air and use that to figure it out. So when it hits the ground, its displacement in the vertical direction is going to be zero. We know its initial and final uh, speed are going to be the same, but in opposite directions. And we know the acceleration. So we can plug those numbers in to find how long it's in the air and then use that to figure out how far it will travel. So that's clearly option D. So a car of mass 580 kilograms collides with the rear of a stationary van of mass 1200 kilograms. Following the collision, the van moves off with a velocity of 6 meters per second and the car recoils in the opposite direction with a velocity of 1.6. What is the initial speed of the car? This is a classic conservation of momentum type problem. You just need to make sure you get the sign right with the 1.6 and then we plug the numbers in and we get option B. Which graph best represents a velocity time graph for a ball that's dropped from rest and bounces? So if it's bouncing, it's going to be changing direction, which means its velocity should be both positive and negative. The only one that fits that is B. A sample of Y has young modulus E. A second sample of Y made from the same material has three times the length and half the diameter. What is the young modulus of the second sample in terms of E? 
Well, it's going to be E. It's the same material, so it's going to have the same Young modulus. The circuit below, the potential difference across the LED is 1.8 volts when it's emitting light. The current is 20 milliamps. What is the value of the resistor R? So the first thing I did is figure out what the potential difference across the two resistors is. It's going to be 3.2. Then I figured out what the total resistance is using that potential difference and current. Then we subtract the internal resistance of 10, giving us 150 ohms. The combined resistance of n identical resistors connected in parallel is Rn, which statement correctly describes the variation of Rn as n increases. So using our parallel resistor rule, this would be an expression for the total resistance. So we can clearly see that the total resistance is inversely proportional to the number of uh, resistors, which is what we want B essentially, because an inversely proportional is not a straight line graph. The table shows resistivity, length, and cross section area of wires P and Q. The resistance of wire P is R. What's the total resistance of the wires connected in parallel? Well, the way I thought about it is the resistance of Q is going to be a quarter due to the resistivity, but then double because it's half the area, so it's going to end up with half the resistance. Connecting those two in parallel then gives us one third of the resistance. Okay, so the circuit shown is used to supply a variable potential difference to another circuit, which graph shows how PD supplied varies as the contact is moved from P to Q. Uh, so the resistance is going to increase from 0 to 10, so the potential difference is clearly going to increase, which is uh, C or D. And the 10 ohm resistor is double that of 5, so when it's complete it'll have a potential difference of four which is option c so this resistor network the emf of the supply is 12 volts no internal resistance what is a reading on a voltmeter connected between x and y so we have to work out the potential at x and the potential at y so the potential x is it's going to lose 8 volts across the 2 ohm resistor, 4 across the 1 ohm, so X is going to be 4 volts, and Y, it's going to lose uh, 9 volts across the 3 ohm, 3 across the 1 ohm, leaving its 3 volts at Y, giving us a potential difference of 1 volt. A ball of mass 0.5 kilograms is suspended on the end of a piece of string 0.45 meters long, and it's going at 120 revolutions per minute. What is the tension? Uh, so the tension has to be equal to the weight force plus the centripetal force uh, required. Um, and we can calculate the angular speed by working first the revolutions per second and times it by two pi, plug the numbers in, and we end up with 40 newtons. Uh, which graph shows how kinetic energy of a pendulum varies with displacement from the equilibrium position? Uh, so it's maximum at the equilibrium position, so it has to be either A or D, but it's not a straight line relationship, so it's going to be D. Okay, so the graph shows how the displacement of a particle performing SHM varies with time. So which statement is not correct? Speed of the particle is maximum at t over 4. That's true, because it's at zero displacement. That would be a maximum speed. Potential energy is zero at 3 over 4t. That's true. At no displacement, you have no potential energy. Acceleration is, particle is maximum at t over 2. Uh, the acceleration is maximum at maximum displacement. That's true. The restoring force acting on the particle is zero at time t. Uh, no, that's not true. It has maximum restoring force at maximum displacement, which finishes off this paper.